I really enjoy demonstrations that create a lot of mystery and thought and, and to some extent even um, fun. You know, we should have fun once in a while in the classroom. And uh, I want to show you one now that I get that I use with both my advanced classes and with my uh, intro classes that uh, really opens up a huge area of discussion. And so we're going to take a look at it. I'm going to use a long glass tube. Um, it doesn't have to be this big. And in fact, as we work our way through the, the process here, I'll show you a way to do it in a much smaller sy system and in a way that every kid can do it. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this long glass tube and I'm going to place it down on my foot and open the top. And I'm going to pour into it a yellow liquid. And I'm going to fill it roughly halfway with yellow liquid. Good sound here, if you can hear it. You know, that's really roughly halfway. Um, and then I'm going to do the remainder with blue liquid. Kind of pour it down the side. Yeah, there we go. Now this one I'm pouring in a little slower, at least initially. After it's started filling, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. And I'm going to fill this up to the top. And try to leave as little space in it as possible. Okay, so we've got a tube. It's full of blue liquid and yellow liquid. And I'm going to recover. Now, there was a reason why I put this on my foot or the floor. I'm going to put this stopper in it now. When I push that stopper in, there's going to be a little energy transfer through the system. And if I have this freestanding, this stopper goes in, that force will be transferred. This is a little hydrodynamics here. That force will be transferred all the way through the tube to the bottom, and the stopper on the bottom will come out. Now that's a cool demo in itself, and your students will remember it, but it's not the desired effect this time. So I'm going to go with a slightly different setup, and watch me mess this up anyhow now. So we're going to slide that in. I'm not going to shove it in really hard. I'm just going to get it in there so that I know that it's maybe, and I don't know that you can see this, but some of the blue liquid is actually, well, you can see it here. Some of the blue liquid has fallen out and um, eventually ended up on my shoe. So now I'm going to reach down and pick this up. So I've got both ends of it. Now I've got my fingers on both ends. And this is in itself kind of neat because you've got the yellow liquid, you've got the blue liquid on top, and you've got an interface where they're coming together that's kind of greenish. And if you look closely, there are no air bubbles in here. Now I'm going to start to rotate this slowly. And actually, I would have... You know, this is good. Yeah, bring it in slowly. And bring it down. And get it horizontal. And as you can see, blue liquid starting to spread the green interface first and then going down to the other side. And once again, I'm getting a layering effect. Still no air bubbles in there. And I've got a blue layer and a yellow layer. And I think, you know, at this point, one of the things you can just talk about is that, hey, what do I know about the blue liquid and the yellow liquid? Well, one's floating on top of the other one. There's a difference in density. I would not do this in class the way that I just did it. I would have kids tell me about it. I'd have them make observations. It would not be a case where I'm saying, oh, look, there, there are different densities. Uh, because this is something that can make some cool observations. Now I'm going to rotate it up. And wow, look at that. Hold it. Must be leaking. Well, no, I don't see anything on the floor. Look at that. 
bubbles coming up through the solution? My gosh. Let's roll it back the other way. Hey, look at that. Bring it back. Now I can get it level. Here's a whole other demonstration. If, the, if your students have ever seen the level, <laughs> they know there's an air bubble inside it. And if I could get this level, I could make this thing sit in the middle. But uh, it's not going to happen for me right now. But there's that bubble back. Wow, where'd all that space come from? Back and forth. Look at that guy. There's something else you've noticed here, I hope. What color is it? It's green now. Let's see. Yellow and blue make green. What did I just learn about these two liquids? I just learned that they mix together. Because the colors have mixed and given me a, a greenish color that I can see here. So that's kind of neat, back and forth, back and forth. Now, again, student volunteer for this. If I had someone coming up, and if you hold this test tube, especially near the middle, it's pretty warm. There's actually some heat being generated in here. Again, I could talk about heat as solution, that it's gained some, some energy as it mixed, and, and that's taken place. But I'm still a little confused by the, by the bubble and where it came from. If you ask for suggestions about where the bubble came from, invariably one of the comments is, oh, it's the air that was dissolved in the liquids. And in reality, probably a little bit of that is some air that was in the liquid. But certainly not the quantity that I'm looking at here, which represents oh, maybe five milliliters, maybe a little more than that, depending on this, you know, how well I mixed them together uh, and how uniform the, if they were 50-50. But hey, that's kind of neat too. At some point, we harken back to a, another demonstration that we've done in the past where I've mixed 50 milliliters of alcohol and 50 milliliters of water together and poured them together and the volume that was produced there was slightly less than 100. And now we start to talk about, hey, when you mix solutions together, the molecules rearrange themselves, they pull together, and some of the empty space between the molecules has been filled by those molecules as they get together. The attractive forces between the water and the alcohol pull those molecules closer together, there's less empty space between the molecules, and so the volume decreases. So at that point in time, if, if somebody's remembered that or if I have to lead them to it, and then I ask them, what is this on top? Invariably, invariably my students answer, air, because that's what's in the empty space between the molecules. Got to be air. And certainly, when I was in high school, that would have been my answer. You know, oh, yeah, it's air. The concept of a vacuum is a little difficult to deal with. Um, and so, okay, we come back to this thing and go, hey, all right. If, in fact, this is a vacuum up here, if it's an empty space that's up there, what am I going to notice when I take the top out? There's going to be a pressure change. Pressure on the inside is going to be lower. Pressure on the outside is going to be higher. Now, how do we identify that? Well, I'm going to lean this up against the table and cross my fingers and go over here just to the card for a second and point out something. When I pull that stopper out, if the pressure is higher on the inside, then I am going to hear a sound. And that sound is going to be If, on the other hand, the pressure on the inside is lower, I'm going to hear a sound that goes <laughs> There's the spelling for it. And if the pressure on the inside and the outside are the same, I'm not going to hear anything. Those are the three possibilities. 
And so if there's a vacuum in there, you know, I'm going to hear some serious noise. And so now I'm going to pull this out, stopper, and I'm going to have you listen closely. And I'm going to kind of bend down so my microphone is right next to the top and listen to that sound as it comes through. If I were doing this in a classroom, I'd have a kid up here listening to it. And my students know those sounds. So they would immediately be able to identify which one they hear. And so, did you hear that? It was just a little, just a little bit of, yeah, I know, I, I, I'm right here. I'm old, and I've blown up a lot of stuff, so my hearing's not all that good. But I did hear a little as I opened it up. There was a small pressure difference, and that pressure difference involved pulling in a little bit of air. The pressure inside here was slightly less than the pressure on the outside. Not much, just a little bit. Certainly not the kind of thing I would hear if there was a vacuum in there, because if there was a vacuum, there'd be a big I mean, it's just like you hear when a vacuum-packed can is opened up. There's a serious noise that takes place when you open that can up. This was just a little bit of a So that means the pressure on the inside and the outside were almost the same. So what's in the bubble? Well, now we can really start to get into a whole bunch of stuff that we've learned already and talked about already in class. If I've got what initially was a vacuum inside there, because that was the empty space between the molecules that's, that's giving me that bubble, what are the liquids going to do? They're going to evaporate to fill up that empty space. And in fact, we can look at that. And we can see that. Uh, mathematically, there is a formula called Raoul's Law. We can calculate the mole fractions of the alcohol and the water with their vapor pressures and actually calculate, based on the temperature in here, what the new pressure should be. And that, you know, that's a great AP question because it's the kind of question they get asked on the AP test. Not with a long tube like this, but they'll be asked about the vapor pressure above a mixture. So that's kind of neat. And that's, that's, that's a great application. Um, so one of the things we did is we went to a pressure sensor and we uh, graphed it. So I put a pressure sensor inside this thing and worked from there and looked at the pressure and to see what would happen. And over here I've got a graph of that that we did beforehand. So the pressures are in atmospheres. And you'll notice what happens when you first mix the stuff together. The pressure sensor is just picking up basically atmospheric pressure, a little bit above atmospheric pressure because I had to leave a little extra space in here to do this. So you get a value slightly above because it's the vapor pressure of the liquids and the vapor pressure and the atmospheric pressure that was in there. But once I put the corks in with the sensor in and started to mix it, look what happens to the pressure. It starts out at a little bit over one atmosphere and it drops way down. And then it spikes back up. Some of that's because of the heating going on. But what happens is, as I go over time, and the molecules mix together, and the more and more the uni uniformity of the solution, there's no more mixing, and the pressure starts to level off. And it turns out that it's a little bit below atmospheric pressure at the end. It'll vary a little bit on how warm it gets in the situation of the test tube. But you can see that when you first put it together. Now, physically, I can tell that when I do this because when I pick this thing up and turn it and flip it the first time, I can feel these stoppers move in. I don't really need to push them in very hard because once I pull that thing up, that first pressure drop, the outside pressure pulls those stoppers in. And it pushes them in, and I can feel that happen. So that, you know, just, there's just so much neat science here. Now then you look at it again and you think, okay, I saw bubbles forming throughout the solution. Well, if in fact, that was close to a vacuum when I first started out. And this pressure sensor said it went down to about five tenths of an atmosphere, which isn't anywhere near a vacuum. But even at five tenths of an atmosphere, what's our definition of boiling point? Place where the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. Probably those bubbles I saw forming in there, that was because the liquid was, or the solution in this case, was boiling. I was actually observing boiling taking place. 
And that boiling continued until the pressure, vapor pressure equaled the atmospheric pressure inside the tube, and that's when I stopped seeing the bubbles form. So that's kind of cool, too. Another application of something we've taught that we can see through this really great demonstration. I mean, on a, on a, you know, a cross-curricular level, hey, I just integrated art into my class because blue and yellow give me green. So that's neat. And on a higher level, you know, I can go as far as to Rowell's Law and actually annoy my AP students and have them measure the tube and calculate the percentage of each of the liquids inside there, and then find the mole fractions, use Rowell's Law, and calculate what the pressure should be inside the container. Um, and if I want to really turn it into a, an elegant activity, then go back and see if, in fact, it equals what this thing levels off to at the end. Um, it won't. <laughs> I can tell you that right now, because Raoul's law assumes that these are perfect solutions. And just like ideal gases, they don't exist. So in the real world, it'll be slightly different. But still, you know, you've got a comparison and something that you can look at. All right, that's a huge demonstration. It uses a lot of material. And it's one where I'm getting up and I'm leading a discussion, an inquiry discussion, and asking questions and getting kids to make observations. This works, by the way, equally well with ethanol or methanol. And it's food coloring, a trick that you might as well know about. And this helps me a lot. The yellow is the water. The blue is the alcohol. It's yellow water. Never drink yellow water. There's a reason for that. It has nothing to do with never drink yellow water. It has to do with the fact that the yellow food coloring dye, when you put it in alcohol, precipitates out and doesn't work. The blue doesn't, the yellow does. If you put the yellow dye in your alcohol, you'll get a precipitate, little or no color. So it doesn't work well. But, as is so often the case, I would really like to let every kid in the class do this and do it as a, an inquiry activity so we get a small piece of glass tubing, some corks that'll fit in it, and my instructions to my students are simply this. Work with your lab partner, take a tube, put some yellow liquid in, put some blue liquid in, and see what happens. So let's just do that, and we'll do it a couple of different ways. Uh, with no instructions, I'm gonna start this way. I'm gonna put the blue liquid in first, And then go with some yellow liquid. When I do that, I trust you can see what's happened. Remember when I did it last time? I had a layer of blue and a layer of yellow. But if I do it in the reverse order, with the more dense water going in second, it falls right down. It mixes instantly, and all I get is green. That's a cool observation. That's an interesting thing to see. And, and it tells your students something. And it's something they can write down and they can draw conclusions about. On the other hand, if I reverse it and do it the other way, and the, the cool thing about this is that if I have them play with it, some kids will put in the yellow first, and some kids will put in the blue first. And so they'll have two different sets of results. And they'll look at each other's stuff and go, what happened there? Why did yours like that and mine's not? Immediately, we've got some discussion going on. So now I'm going to put the blue in on top. And the only instruction I give them is to, hey, you want to fill it to the very tippy top, which um, is a scientific term. And then stick the cork in. I don't usually have too much trouble with the corks flying out. So now I've got this tiny one, and they'll take it back to their seat. Sometimes they'll flip it over as they're walking back to their seat. Sometimes they won't. Some will keep it like this, but eventually somebody will turn it. And in fact, we get the same thing we saw on a much smaller scale. 
and in a very short period of time. Since I've told him, now sometimes I annoy him by saying, if there's a bubble in it, you fail. Um, but you can see as I move this back and forth, on a small scale, <laughs> okay, the bubble's there. So two different ways to do the same demonstration. And this one, every kid can do it on the big tube. Uh, it's a classroom discussion. 